I think the main way of learning things is to be driven by problems. The main heart is really that of breaking the problem into simpler one. Failing and doing mistakes is the most important thing. A PhD is more about developing a set of skills to solve big problems. YouTube videos nowadays you can find an impressive amount of material. There is no conservation law that can tell you this is a cat, this is a dog. And where is the difference between PIV and PTV? But you criticize without really saying oh, this is not really good. Controlling a flow is not like playing chess. People not understanding enough. Miguel, uh, welcome to the show. It's really a pleasure to be here at VKI in your office. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you for uh, for coming and thank you for having me. It's uh, it's my pleasure and a big honor to be in your podcast. Thank you so much. Um, I think we had like a half an hour discussion already in the cafeteria to talk about life, business, uh, data-driven fluid mechanics, etc. But maybe tell people who are you in the first place? Who's Miguel? What is your background? What do you actually do here at VKI? Yeah, so um, I'm a um, mechanical engineer. Uh, I, I graduated uh, in uh, University of L'Aquila in Italy. I'm Italian, even though I have a Spanish name, because I was born in uh, Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, I did my bachelor in uh, L'Aquila, mechanical engineering, then master in uh, um, energy engineering at the University of Florence. Then I moved to, to Belgium for my master's thesis here at the Von Karman Institute to to, to learn more about fluid mechanics and I never left since uh, since then. And now I'm a professor here where I teach several courses on um, on fluid mechanics, on uh, signal processing, uh, data-driven methods and machine learning. Very, very good. You also did your PhD. What was the PhD all about? Um, so yeah, my PhD was, uh, I, I did it here and was about uh, uh, the instability of an industrial process which is uh, which is called the jet wiping process is a galvanization process uh, typically you have a plate uh, that you dip into a bath of molten zinc you would draw at a certain speed and then you you remove the excess of liquid with a with what they call an air knife so you have an impinging jet uh, that uh, that controls the amount of thickness that you have in this plate so there's a lot of fluid mechanics on the on the impingement of the flow on the liquid film is a multi-phase flow there's a lot of thermal problems because the, the zinc is of course very hot mm -hmm. the gas is cold and there are several uh, interesting instabilities that develops and my my thesis was about understanding these instabilities why did you decide to do a phd in the first place because next question is then going to be does a phd make sense for some students and when does it not make sense to do a phd so what was your reason to do a phd just being an inquisitive in individual or what was it it was a combination of things. Uh, curiosity, of course, was one of the main things. And then I, I was lucky that I, ha I, I had uh, uh, what, to, what we call here the master program here at the Von Karman Institute, which, which would really start to, let's say, uh, do a bit of research. So uh, to enter into the world of, uh, of, uh, of research. And, and I liked that and I was more curious about that. So I wanted to know more. That was one thing. Uh, so just learn more about these things. And the other was to some extent to yeah to complete my 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 background my my skills my technical skills but also uh, on the soft skills i saw the phd as a unique opportunity to learn many things and so i, I wanted to take uh, to take this opportunity really cool so when do you advise people maybe not to do a phd what skill sets do you need to bring of course you need to be motivated you need to be dedicated but i think motivation enough is not enough to actually do a phd you also need to have the discipline right to do it maybe to do it three to five years so what do you think are the prerequisites to do a PhD and when does it not make sense? Maybe it's the question. That's a, that's a very difficult question. Uh, um, I think it, it's a very personal experience uh, in the sense that uh, you will not find two PhDs that, uh, that share the same opinion and the same, the same path towards uh, uh, concerning that. Um, I think uh, to, to do a PhD means to put yourself into a, a big project, so at the front line of, uh, of, of, of a specific topic. Means then uh, trying to develop uh, all a set of uh, skills that you, are, that you need to face in the intermediate challenges that will take there. And you have to be somehow interested or have, have an interest to, to bring knowledge forward in a specific, uh, in a specific domain. Uh, to me, in principle, it makes sense well, all the time. I mean, uh, for for everyone to mm. do to do a PhD, for everyone who's uh, keen to 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 learn a lot, let's say, and to put itself on the on the frontiers of uh, of of a specific field. Now, it does not mean that you have to do a PhD. Mm. Uh, I know many many wonderful engineers that uh, 
that uh, that don't have a PhD and can do a fantastic job. Uh, so it's difficult for me to set a threshold, but maybe what I will say is uh, that that the PhD is somehow boosting all your skills. It's uh, three or four years, depending on the countries in which you are on your own. You have to face a problem. You have someone who, who, who accompanies you, who helps you, but it's your thing, your project, your stuff that you have to bring in in all these aspects from uh, from the screws that you use in your facility to the python code that you have to develop to process the things to the whole things whereas in industry you for what i've seen you you mostly work on someone else's project and then uh, it takes you more time before you get into into your own thing let's say yeah maybe it's not generalizable but do you think you have more creative freedom in your phd depends probably also on the supervisor right Yes, it depends a lot on your supervisor. Uh, all, in general, yes, I would say. But well, let me be clear on, on this. Uh, I don't have enough experience in industry, so I feel uh, uh, I don't want to, let's say, say uh, I don't have that other side of the of the perspective. I mean, I've been working with many com with many industries, doing consultancies and with many companies. So I saw what I what I saw from from this side. I've never been on on that side. So I can mostly say what I see on this side. Yeah. So let's assume someone wants to do their PhD, maybe even a second master's at VKI, or maybe like their first master's. Do you have different programs here at VKI? Maybe you could explain quickly what these programs are and how people could actually apply for them. Sure. So we have three main programs here at VKI. Um, one program is the short training program, which is dedicated to usually undergraduate students that they come maybe here for their bachelor thesis or master thesis, mostly master thesis, but mm -hmm. we do have also some bachelor. Sometimes it can happen that there's also a PhD student that wants just to come here for a few months to, to, to work on a specific facility or on a specific project. But mm -hmm. this is a program that can go anywhere from three to max, max six months. And you focus on a project, you just work on a specific project. Then we have the research master program, which is a nine month program where you also where we also give courses, uh, very specialized courses, let's say. Uh, so it's at the master level, master after master level, mm -hmm. where people specialize into ex experimental fluid mechanics or numerical fluid mechanics uh, in various areas of, uh, of fluid mechanics. Here at VKI, we touch a broad range from from hypersonics to to, to laminar flows in lubrication. And in th that, you have a degree also, which is associated to that. It takes nine months, and this you have uh, half of your work is spent on on a project, and half is spent on courses. And then we have a PhD program, which is a four-year program, which is usually carried out in collaboration with Belgian universities, but not necessarily. Sometimes we have also other universities from US or in Europe, but uh, that it's a classic PhD, let's say, but uh, as you will find it in the university, but usually here you tend to work on more, uh, um, more applied uh, problems, mm -hmm. let's say. What would you say is the most or the coolest thing, the most fascinating thing, most rewarding thing as a professor, and the most frustrating thing when working with students, for example, or PhD students? Um, there are many rewarding things, more than uh, than uh, than frustrating things, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Uh, the, the main one, I, I would say, is when you see the student grow. Mm -hmm. When you see the student take uh, ownership of the problem, ownership of the challenge, and and you know, let's say, live it uh, and 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 really fight for it and do and do things to make sure that 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 uh, that uh, that you reach the goal, that you reach the target. So, the development, I would say, the development of the student uh, is probably the most rewarding part. You see that uh, somehow you you direct the growth. Uh, hopefully in the right uh, place. Frustration, um, well, that's difficult, but I think that uh, um, one, one, one thing that, let's say, one worry that one could have as a, as a professor, as it follows a student, is not being able to, to understand the student. Because mm -hmm. every student is different, yeah. and every student has a different feelings, different ways of living this experience, and uh, different priorities, and, you have to be good at understanding where the, the where where the the tree. It's like a little tree that wants to grow. You have to understand where it wants to grow and and help this grow. And if you don't understand it immediately, you might damage the tree. You know, yeah, yeah. you might damage the little plant. Yeah. Some students, I know that I also got that question: is when do I know when to ask a question? 
to my professor. Sometimes my, if I ask that question, it might come off a bit stupid. Should I ask as many questions as I possibly can? Or should I maybe find out on my own? Because I think it's in, as a student, the same as in business. If you don't ask questions and you don't, if you don't get boundaries from your supervisor, from someone else who has done it before, it feels like you make the same mistake. Okay, you learn from it, but it takes you so much time sometimes. So where do you see the balance of, okay, I can ask a question and when is it annoying, quote unquote? It's very rarely annoying, I would say, in my experience. So I encourage to, let's say, to err in the excess, better to ask more than to ask yeah. less. Uh, and then I think that uh, to some extent, the relation between a PhD and a supervisor is something that is built with time. Uh, so maybe at the beginning, you might feel as like you're asking too many questions and that uh, you feel insecure or, 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 or whatever. But uh, but things develop natural. Uh, if you have a good relation with your supervisor and, and you, you clearly have know that you're going in the right direction, at some moment you will stop asking. Uh, even thinking about that, uh, you see, things will become natural during a meeting. Maybe, maybe you 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 ask. Uh, we ask a question together, right? We we try to get to the questions together, and we try to see how to get there, and so on and so forth. So, I will say better to err in the excess, ask more than less, and and then probably through the relation that things will will develop. And I will say, soon after uh, after a short time, you hopefully will know yourself. Uh, uh, where is the boundary? Let's say you 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 get it into it naturally. Yeah. What would you say? Like maybe your top three tips for students when pursuing a master or PhD level. What would you give them as advice? Like some learnings from your own PhD, maybe as well. Fail fast, fail often, maybe <laughs> something like this. Um, yes, I think uh, failing and doing mistakes is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's the most. Uh, Rewarding experience is where you learn the most. Mm. If you don't fail and if you don't do mistakes, uh, you're not learning. Uh, so for sure, doing the mistakes is, is important. Be open-minded, I would say. Uh, many people start a PhD thinking that uh, they are going to academia, that PhD is only for those that then go to academia. And this is far from true. I think uh, there are here we have many PhDs that then end up in industry and mm. go to work somewhere else. Uh, a PhD is more about 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 developing a set of skills to solve big problems, and this is relevant in industry, in academia, or any anywhere else. So be open minded, do mistakes, be okay with mistakes. It's part of the of the of the learning, um, and don't be uh, maybe too hard on yourself. Sometimes a student has sets the bars too high, mm. sets the objective too high, and this can can result into to frustration. Yeah, that makes sense. So the question now is for me, what resources do you generally recommend to students? Because some students, they love reading books. And I see behind you, there's the latest book, Data Driven Fluid Mechanics from you and some other colleagues, yes. which we're also going to put a link down in the description so people can check it out. Bought it myself as well. Super nice to read, by the way. I haven't gone through the whole material, but it's basically derived from a course that you also do here at VKI, which we'll talk about in a bit. So what resources do you generally recommend? Is it just a combination of different things? Is it learning from the expertise of your supervisor plus books plus internet videos? internet videos, for example, YouTube videos, uh, what would you recommend them not to do? Um, I think the main way of learning things is to be driven by problems. So to give yourself a problem. Yeah. And at the beginning, maybe you give yourself a simple problem, then a slightly harder, then a slightly harder, and then harder and harder and harder. Put the problem at the center. And once you tackle the problem, you will start needing a set of tools. Um, Books, of course, are a must, uh, must the main source, of, at least in my case. YouTube videos nowadays, you can find an impressive amount of material I'm, that, that, that was not available, uh, not even at my time. So you can find many resources online. You can, the, the amount of information that you can get through all of these channels, books, uh, videos online, this is fantastic, but it can be overwhelming if you just focus on, on the idea that you need to gather knowledge before you tackle a problem. I think this would be a mistake because there's, there's simply too much. Yeah. But if you're driven by a problem and maybe you have some advisor or someone who, who, who drives you towards what could be the tools to get to that solution, then I think the learning experience is, is much more enjoyable and much, uh, much nicer. Yeah, definitely. When we go back to your thesis, you said you worked on instabilities. 
So what kind of instability was that? Maybe to go a little bit into the, the area of fluid mechanics and then also talking about industrial fluid mechanics. I think that would also be super interesting, like real problems and not like students working on the pipe flow or whatever. And maybe you could talk about the instabilities first and then we'll move over to industrial fluid mechanics. Yeah, so um, my, my, my problem was about an instability that originates when uh, the jet impinges on this liquid, as I, as I was saying. So yeah. uh, it's a very complex problem because uh, you have very high speed flow for the jet, usually almost Mach 1, so let's say 250, 270 meters per second, things like that. Uh, so very high speed in a slit, which is usually 1.5 millimeters. And the liquid film can be of the order of maybe 30 microns. So you have a huge gap of scales between the scales of turbulence, the scales of the liquid and so on. It cannot be simulated right nowadays. I mean, this is something which there's no CFD. There's no, there's no handbook solution, let's say. And uh, what we saw is that basically this instability uh, manifests as an interaction between the jet and the liquid. Uh, and this was uh, at the beginning postulated because it could not be simulated, could not be seen in the lab. Uh, there are no experimental techniques that can handle so easily uh, 480 degrees uh, uh, Celsius for the liquid. Uh, so it's a very complicated environment. So no, no experiment, no way of, of seeing things, but uh, the, there were many theories behind, behind what could originate this instability. So what, what we learned from previous works was that usually in some condition, the jet might start to oscillate. And since the jet, the jet is, is wiving, is what is controlling the thickness of the plate. If the jet starts to oscillate, then you will see waves. And the industry came to us because, because of these waves, uh, when you, you don't want to have these waves. Mm. One, one way to limit them was to reduce the speed. Uh, of, but this reduces also the production line. So the question and the, my big problem on that was what generates these waves? And I, I had a very good guidance from my, from my supervisor, Professor Buklan, who, who really guided me towards trying to take a very complex problem and, and break it into simple problems, problems that could be uh, solved more easily and then maybe try to find the patch to link mm. them. So we, we established uh, an experimental procedure where we break the problem into small ones. So first we studied the, we, we in a facil dedicated facility how a jet responds to disturbances on a liquid film which impinges on that. Then we studied, uh, we replaced the liquid by a solid membrane that could be controlled, whose shape could be controlled by us but not be influenced by the jet. So we were imposing the shapes. And then we went back into the jet wiping facility. So we break the problem into different parts until we understood how this instability was uh, was originating, let's say. Got it. So when we go back to this industrial problem, how do you tackle it? Is it just divide and conquer if someone from the industry comes to you? How do you approach such a problem? Because there is no, as you said, like book solution out there of this of, of these cases. So how do you personally tackle that? How do you start a project like this? I think the, the, the main heart uh, is really that of breaking the problem into simpler one, simplifying. If, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if you see someone who has a lot of experience in that, is someone who knows how to simplify. Uh, because the full problem cannot be tackled. Usually when the industry comes to see us, uh, they've already tried several other solutions. So um, it, 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 you will never, never be able to tackle those kind of problems in their uh, full complexity. So try to divide it, uh, then find, of course, well, after you've divided, you're always with the question, yes, but uh, we have separate, we have decoupled this interaction. So how is this interaction in fact happening? You removed it by separating the two things. And don't. And so then the work is to try to see how the two things could have uh, uh, interacted. But at least you understand one thing at the time, let's say one problem at the time. It's really fascinating because Mila van Peric, said exactly the same thing in his podcast when he had like a FSI problem of a ship design. And he was actually also saying the same thing, dividing the problem and just tackling the simple things and then trying to find out from first principles where the problem actually lies. That's super interesting to hear that again from you, Miguel. So it's really, really cool. Uh, I'm happy that I have the same opinion of Milan. <laughs> yeah, really cool. And when we talk about the experimental techniques, could you maybe name some of them that you've used personally? And we've even had in the coffee break the discussion of like PAV and PTV, the differentiation. I think some people don't even know what PTV is in the first place. Maybe you could explain the limitations of PAV and what PTV brings to the table. Yes. So in my thesis, I used mostly optical based uh, techniques. Uh, so 
flow visualization, of course. So mm. you typically illuminate, uh, you, you see the flow, normally you, you see the flow with seeding particles, then you illuminate it with a laser. And then depending on how you acquire the images, you can enter very different worlds. So when you, we call flow visualization uh, acquisitions that usually have a large exposure. So you don't really see these particles, you just see like smoke, quote, quote. And so you see the macroscopic uh, scales of, of the, of things, in our case, the jet, for example. You can combine this with image processing and then maybe, for instance, in our case, find the position of the jet, how it is flapping, what frequency, what amplitude, and so try to extract quantitative information from there. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you can have uh, what we call sometimes laser tomography. So you, you illuminate always with a laser uh, a liquid film, for instance, in which you have diluted a fluorescent to to, to produce uh, fluorescence uh, emission, which usually happens at a uh, at a wavelength that is different from the from the one that they're using for the illumination. So then, with optical filters, you can separate what is the laser from the fluorescence in the liquid, and so you can see the liquid with a lot of contrast. And from there, use image processing to get, uh, for instance, the interface, how the interface is moving, and things like that. So this is what I call quantitative flow visualization. Mm -hmm. So visualize and then use image processing. I use the um, laser absorption methods to characterize the thickness of the liquid film. So here it's also an optical technique. You, you measure the thickness distribution of a liquid film from the amount of light that it absorbs from a okay. backlight. So mm -hmm. you will typically acquire images on a, the dry wall, see how much light you have. Then when the liquid is on it, you see how much light is missing and mm -hmm. you can relate this to the local thickness um, here in, in, in your domain. And then when it comes to PAV or PTV, um, so this is a special case of, let's say, flow quantitative flow visualization technique. You usually use a laser sheet, at least in the planar version. Nowadays, you have also a lot of 3D techniques. And the idea is that you seed the, the flow with particles, as you do for the flow visualization. But now you, you acquire at much shorter exposure. It's a bit as if you take a picture of something that is moving very fast. You need to, if you want to see it and distinguish it, you need to e expose it for very short time, right? Otherwise, the image is blurred because of the motion. So PAV or PTV is about uh, freezing the motion of small particles in these images so that then you can compute the velocity of these particles and build flow fields from experiments. Now, where is the difference between PAV and PTV? It's just in the way you treat the images. So in, in PIV, you typically divide in the, the, the video, the images into small windows mm -hmm. or, or voxels if you go 3D, and you try to get an average motion within that uh, window, that interrogation window, and you usually do that through cross-correlation. So you're averaging uh, in, the, in that window. Mm -hmm. The window can be can be made quite small, but you still need to have enough particles to average. So there is a limit. You cannot really make it very small. PTV stands for particle tracking velocimetry. It means that you're not going to average anything. You're going to track each individual particle. And so it would be a Lagrangian measurement. So you, you really track all, all of them. It is usually more difficult. Uh, in the past, you, you could do that only if the seeding was sufficiently low. Nowadays, we can use particle tracking on very dense uh, images. So it means that you have much more points, not averaged everywhere in your domain. Got it. W when it comes to the evaluation of these results, then you probably have a ton of data. Is there any specific software that you use? Have you developed it yourself? Are there open source software packages out there? How did you approach that problem? Um, both, both things. So there are many open source packages for instance, when it comes to PAV or PTV, there are really amazing tools on Python or MATLAB. Mm -hmm. uh, and we mostly use them uh, off the shelf with very minor modifications sometimes here and there, but very minor. Um, other, which are much more more specific, like light absorption, for example, is not as common as PAV. Mm. On that, we really had to develop our own uh, codes, our own things. Uh, same for the quantitative flow visualization. It was very specific to look for a specific jet doing doing those specific, specific things, let's say. And this is part of the challenges that I was referring to when you when I was talking about PhD. So a PhD, you need to have a big question. Why is this jet flapping and why is this happening? But to solve those big questions, you have many intermediate small things and you have to get down to code your own, to your own, your own things. Mm. 
And then uh, another big uh, challenge that we have when we go to PTV, for example, is that uh, because you don't have velocity points uh, in a grid, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to compute uh, quantities such as vorticity or, you know, to take derivatives or things like that. So in, in that case, handling data on an unstructured grid is not trivial. It's still a, an active field of research. And we've been developing tools to, to do that, to using machine learning techniques about which maybe we will talk later to, to somehow try to get all, all this quantitative information without the need of a grid. Yeah, that's interesting. The code is called Spicy. Yes, so this call is uh, is called Spicy. We have recently submitted in the to the to the JOS, the Journal of Open Software, mm -hmm. and we created um we have the GitHub repository. We are now creating a small uh, YouTube course uh, to to explain what's the theory behind that and also how to use it. And really cool. Obviously, we'll also put the link down in the description for your YouTube channel because in the coffee break we talked uh, or I talked to Miguel on actually creating more YouTube videos and actually doing a course on hands-on fluid mechanics. So I know I said it on the podcast, so you can't uh, check it out right now, Miguel. So <laughs> you yes. have to do it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Definitely. But you will talk to VKI and then maybe we'll, let's see if people, I think people are going to be super interested in taking this course. I think you offer it once a year at VKI, right? I've taken yep. it myself, I think two years ago. Really amazing. And also this is what the book is based on. Yeah. But still there's way more to that. So. No, this is the first time announcement here on the podcast. Miguel is going to do a course. <clears throat> I'm going to hold you accountable, Miguel. So Yes, okay. <laughs> but uh, I mean, with your support and your uh, experience on that, you have a lot of uh, much more experience than me on uh, on online courses and uh, and and these things. But uh, yeah, that would be that would be fantastic. Yeah, okay. Cool. Let's see. Really cool. That brings us to the next topic of data-driven fluid mechanics. So, what is it in the first place? I know a lot of haters will watch this podcast saying it's only curve fitting. We talked about that before. So maybe let's describe in your own words, what is data-driven fluid mechanics? Why is it so essential to work with data-driven fluid mechanics? And uh, why has it gained such, let's say, prominence in the last years? So um, data-driven fluid mechanics, uh, well, as data-driven whatever, and data-driven engineering or data-driven whatever is um, the 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 use of methods from uh, from machine learning or data analytics um, applied for for problems in fluid mechanics. Now, uh, it's, I understand why there are many haters because of course the word the the, the data driven fluid mechanics might sound weird. Of course, fluid mechanics has always been driven by data, uh, experimental or numerical data. It's still one of the field that has probably the largest amount of empiricism. Let's say there are many unclosed, uh, unsolved problems for which we do need data. Uh, and we've been doing that since the uh, early days. I mean, uh, the example that I like to give to my students is if you take uh, a boundary layer theory and uh, the, the, the works of the giants like, like, like von Karman or yeah. Prandt, uh, they always end up having a certain level of empiricism. It's unavoidable. This is true for a mixing length model to a k-epsilon model. You always start with from some physics, uh, some conservation laws, some first principles, some some very sound uh, um, physical knowledge, and then you arrive at a, po a moment in which you need to fit something. So, in the case of uh, of the boundary layer profile, the, my favorite example is the famous constant uh, von Karman constant, mm. zero point forty one. That's yeah. an example of fitting that comes from first from a long chain of physical reasoning. So, you start by saying there should be this mixing land that should be linearly proportional to the distance from the wall. Then, out of that, you get into you develop physics takes you to the final uh, point where you end up into a logarithm curve. But then you have to fit this curve, mm -hmm. and and this has always been done using uh, classic uh, ad hoc solutions, and now with machine learning you start having more tools to fit more complex model to better uh, to 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 better understand the uncertainties, the generalization capabilities of the model. So let's say more fitting power. Let's put it like that. Yeah, definitely. When it comes to like the differentiation between all of these ML methods, we have deep learning, obviously machine learning, and then. In machine learning, supervised, unsupervised learning, we have then also a separate part, which is reinforcement learning and all these kind of things. So how do you, or how did you tackle your first ML project? And how did you maybe divide and conquer? We talked about this before, especially in the industrial setting, like getting the data set, data is super messy, noisy, whatever. How do you approach such a problem? 
That is a, a also a very difficult question. It's very much problem independent. It really depends on what is your question, mm -hmm. um, because that sets the kind of data that you need and how much of it you need uh, and so on and so forth. So obviously, if you're tackling um, turbulence modeling, you might need the very high fidelity data, very detailed data that you can only uh, obtain from DNS or, or, or very advanced uh, measurement techniques such as PATV, even 3D PTV or things like that. But that's just one part uh, and probably the, the, the one niche, I would say. There are many other things, uh, more at an engineering level, more on a simplified models, uh, where you can use these tools and these ideas. I can give you some examples. Um, recently, we've been uh, uh, interested in developing um, correlations for um, aerodynamic coefficients in a flapping wing in conditions for which there is no empirical correlation out there. And you can use machine learning techniques to try to get this correlation on the fly, on the data, maybe while a drone is flying, for instance. Um, or uh, think of uh, heat transfer coefficient in a cryogenic tank. That's another problem which we are tackling with, uh, with our students. Mm -hmm. um, there are no correlations not right now, and CFD cannot help you there, uh, to predict how much heat and mass transfer happens in a tank which is partially filled with the liquid and its vapor and maybe you shake it and thermal mixing happen and you can have a strong heat and mass transfer. And this can have a strong pressure fluctuations in the, in the tank and you don't want them. And the only solution right now is to maybe vent some of this liquid. And this is very precious cryogenic liquid. You don't want to vent it. So you can try to build a machine learning model that finds these coefficients from the data online while the tank is sloshing. Yeah. And there are many other examples which I will give. And what I can say is that in all these problems, the divide and conquer strategy has always been write down a physical model, try to use physics as much as you can, go to, to the final equation where you will have conservation of mass, momentum, energy, whatever, and learn to live with the unknown, leaving it as a coefficient. Maybe it's a heat transfer coefficient, maybe it's a skin friction coefficient or a drug coefficient or something like that. And then use your expertise in physics and machine learning to close this problem. But the machine learning is always coming as a complement to, to the physics, not to replace it. Yeah, that also probably brings us to the question of, we talked about this also in the break, is a CFD had the same problem back then where people were thinking, okay, no experiments anymore. We have CFD, it's gonna solve everything. We're gonna be the happiest engineers ever. And now um, data-driven methods come along. So do you think it's, as you said, a complementary method to experiments and CFD, it kind of sits in between. Uh, it's more like a um, productivity slash enhancement tool for engineers, or where do you see it sitting now on the spectrum? Exactly as you said, I think it really sits in between. It's a set of complementary tools yeah. uh, that uh, that you need to, to integrate with, uh, with the, the existing one, with engineering and physics. Um, so often I'm asked whether this will replace that or things like mm. that, but uh, my answer is generally no. Uh, I don't think, uh, at least in the foreseeable future, that uh, there will be, there will even be a competition between these things because they're, uh, I usually, at least in my work, we use it for very different things. I never, never had a situation where I could say, ah, for this I will use physics or for this I will use mach machine learning. Mm -hmm. It's always, I can use physics up to here and then I need machine learning to give me that extra, that extra step. Yeah. When we talk about that extra set, what was that, for example? And maybe you have specific scenarios where you could say, I used a data-driven method, didn't know what to do, and then machine learning helped me to explore, maybe or to extrapolate in a specific area, just to help me understand what's happening in a specific area, which I couldn't predict using a physics-based model such as CFD. Um, if I take, uh, for instance, the case of this loshing of this tank, yeah. uh, uh, Right now, there are no CFD models, not reliable CFD models that could predict this. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of whether I do CFD or I do something else. Um, so we're back to the lab. We try to get the data and uh, we try to get a lot of it. Um, and we, we try to use our knowledge in scaling laws and dimensionless analysis to, to, to make correlations, let's say generalize or respect uh, scaling laws and, and properties that we know as fluid mechanics should, should hold. And, and so in that case, the extra step could be, for instance, try to find these, uh, these, uh, the, these correlations such that uh, your model can then be used to make predictions, controls or something like that, and then maybe integrate it with, C with CFD. 
Uh, in my experience, I, I, I really I cannot imagine a case where I, where I could really say I was in doubt whether I should use yeah. uh, one or the other. I don't know if this answers your question. Uh, it definitely answers. It comes back to the complementary thing. You yes. Basically kind of choose one or the other or it complements each other. Yes. So I think that makes sense. So the, the question then is who can profit for, from that, like cui bono, as we said before, who profits? Um, because I think there is this perception of, well, I have five data points. I can use machine learning now. Or like in the industry, people probably don't have the right amount of data, maybe not the, um, the goal in mind, the business use case, or maybe the specific KPI in mind that they want to be optimizing for. And then maybe they overestimate what AI can do because we have seen what OpenAI and DeepMind are doing. They use like a brute force approach. So I always say on the podcast to use a ton of machines, solve a specific problem, very niche application. But in engineering, in the industry, you usually don't have these big machines or you don't want to spend millions of dollars running an, or training an ML model. So um, what is the optimal use case and when should I use it as an engineer? Um, hmm. Let's say the first, who would benefit from that? I think everybody was sufficiently open-minded and knows enough about the two things. So what I see now, but I think this is also happening in the, in the case of CFD in the 90s, as you were mentioning, is a lot of extremism, right? Saying either it's, ah, oh, it's just cool fitting. I don't want to go into that. Or why should I use the machine learning if I already have the simulation in the first place? Maybe mm -hmm. we can talk about that, mm -hmm. that question also later. Um, I think if you start setting, uh, getting extremist positions, you are not uh, going, you're going to have troubles. Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is one thing. And, and the other thing is about uh, uh, be careful on what are the expectations and what you can expect. Mm -hmm. This is a very delicate point, uh, very delicate because of the way machine learning has been always developed from its initial uh, developments. Machine learning has, has had success because it was able to learn things, let's say to learn functions, to interpolate, we're talking about interpolation if you want, or regression or whatever, to find functions for things for which there was no other way but experience. And experience, when I say experience, I mean data. Mm -hmm. So think of, for instance, uh, I don't know, recognizing a cat from a dog. There is no conservation law that can tell you this is a cat, this is a dog. And the fact that you can learn this decision boundary in a very high dimensional space of the all possible images by just using data gives you an idea of how powerful these methods are. Yeah. But then when you go into, into physics, into engineering, you obviously don't want the machine learning to reinvent the wheel. You know that there are things that, that should happen, uh, conservation laws or, 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 or things like this. So finding this mariage between the two is not easy. Uh, me, I will simply say, encourage people to be skeptical uh, uh, against for thi on things that are only, I mean, are promising uh, machine learning ways to re completely replace the physics. Uh, I'm always very skeptical about those things. And my main advice would be to be open enough, try to learn enough from these two things to find opportunities, be open-minded and say. Yeah, I think it's also advice for PhD students, like in general, as we talked about in the early days, but I think open-mindedness in general is, I think, a very good approach because even on Twitter, when you post something about physics and form neural networks, and then people are already waiting to just come in and say, well, of course it has to be physics and form, and where's the physics and the neural network can't learn physics in the first place. So I think this is very essential to maybe know the limitations, but also know the big advantages that these methods bring, which brings us to the point of physics. So. How do you actually maybe have a specific use case in mind that you've worked on? How do you embed physics into a neural network? There are many ways. Um, one way is if you want architectural. So make sure that the network cannot mess up too much because, because you are constrained it so much architecturally speaking that it cannot really mess up. And I will give you an example. Another is through the learning itself. So you could try to put uh, constraints in the learning or penalties, and that's much easier. And that's mm -hmm. what uh, physics informed neural network do. So you, you penalize the network for not respecting certain things. Okay. Um, I would say this, so either architecturally or in the learning process. Now, I want to give an example of architectural and an example of, uh, of, of penalty. So in a recent work on, on thermal turbulence modeling, for example, uh, a student of mine, Matilde Fiore, 
uh, developed a, a, an artificial neural network to predict the turbulent heat flux in a low prand, so liquid metal fluid, is a very challenging problem, be precisely because of the low prand. So there's a lot of diffusion, a lot of conduction, which messes up with the convection. And so there are many constraints that you need to, to impose to this network uh, that comes from physics. For instance, you know that on average, heat goes from high temperature to low temperature, mm -hmm. and not the other way around. Yeah. Uh, you know that your model should not depend on uh, on how you place the axis in your simulation uh, and things like that. So what she came out uh, with uh, was an architecture that uh, had all this constraint enforced architecturally. So the network could not violate the second principle of thermodynamics, could not violate the Galilean invariance and things like that, just because of the way it was structured. Yeah. An example of, of constraints in the training uh, you might instead go for penalties. For instance, uh, predictions that uh, tend to violate physical principles could be heavily penalized so that then during the training, the network does not go in this direction. But there, there is another word because you can go for penalties or, or constraints. So penalties means that uh, what it means, so pen you penalize, but uh, does not mean that uh, the network will, will actually care about that penalization. It's always difficult to say how much do I penalize. Mm -hmm. And constraint is about adding Lagrange multipliers and making the learning process, which is already very complex, even more complex. So these, I think, are still um, open open fields. I would say. Yeah. What do? You, how do you see the future then evolving? What's your future vision for these networks to be able to perform better, even faster? Or where where do you see like the maybe even the limit of these networks? Do we even need to solve I don't know a whole aircraft in like I don't know two minutes, three minutes by training a neural network? Is it even useful? Um, the topic of accelerating CFD using neural network is a topic uh, on, on its own. Mm. And there are interesting development. It's not my field, so I don't want to say bad things there. Uh, but it is a topic on its own. Uh, I think they can contribute in various areas. Um, in what I call the data generation process, which is CFD, for example, make the CFD go faster. In accuracy, so try to find a closure which is better than an existing model for a specific case. And then I would say in uh, in in the use of the data once it has been already, let's say, post-mortem, once the data is there, so you try to, to have a network that can then lead to faster prediction. So somehow to replace the CFD. I see um, potentials in each of these. So, uh, on the case of uh, of improving models, it was the case of turbulence modeling, as we just said. So try to the fact that you now have more muscles and more structured tools to 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 calibrate models gives you more avenues towards better models. Accelerating CFD is a topic on its own. is about trying to see to what extent you can alternate, for example, between. Uh, uh, a prediction from the real CFD or from a surrogate. Uh, so there, are, there, is a, there is a lot of work going in this direction to make the CFD go faster. And then there is one which is uh, often linked to the question that people ask, uh, but why do I need uh, a neural network if I have a lot of CFD mm -hmm. on, on its own, which mm -hmm. is what I call, let's say, post-mortem uh, usage of this data, uh, which is uh, what you can see some sort of dimensionality reduction or, or englobing or assimilating all the simulation that you have done into a network. Imagine I have uh, billions of simulations of the flow past an airfoil, and then you come and you give me a new design. And maybe this new design is very similar to another one, which I have already run. So I can just take from my chef the simulation, which I did, and maybe the two that are closer and, and either relaunch another CFD or try to interpolate between them or things like that. But this implies that you need to store all the simulations which you have ever done. Instead, you could train a network to somehow try to, to make this archiving job for you. So the network could learn, let's say, out of all these simulations and then offer you a fast prediction without you having to redo the simulations or things like that. So generate new data, there is avenue there. Yeah. Accelerate the process, so uh, accelerate the process of generating data, uh, improving accuracy of existing models, and also post-mortem treatment, let's say, of, of the data. Yeah, I think it was a perfect summary, Miguel. I think we can extract it as a separate clip and put it on YouTube <laughs> and chop it up. A very good summary. I think also there's this misconception of, especially when you do aerodynamics analysis of a plane or of a car, for example, in the wake region, I think sometimes people have the misconception that I have the CFD simulation already. Why would I predict something I know? Not knowing that you actually train the model with the training data, and then you have to test data to actually test the model and actually the Deep learning models do a very good job of predicting something that has not been seen before. Like you change the 
the angle of the spoiler, for example, and we'd still predict something very accurately, which I think is super fascinating as we talked about cats and dogs. But then something for engineering, this might become like a, a simple use case in the future um, as we evolve and move towards even more powerful techniques. But the question is, there's this millennium problem, like solving turbulence or solving, yeah, solving turbulence, for example. Do you think that machine learning or deep learning methods will help us engineers to find new ways to solve problems, even solving turbulence, whatever that might mean? And if it, is it even useful for us engineers to solve a specific problem like turbulence, for example? Yeah, uh, well, as you said, solving turbulence can mean many things. Yeah. Uh, and the example that we could, that I was mentioning, uh, um, we can nowadays predict uh, the pressure drop in a pipe, even if we don't understand the finest uh, turbulence uh, uh, scales and the finest things that, that are going on in such a complicated and inherently multi-scale problem. Mm. So there are different scales to, 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 to this answer. So I, I don't know um, that to which degree uh, one, the, these tools can go towards solving turbulence in the sense of having a predictive model that can work on any geometry, any configurations or, or, or any situation. Mm -hmm. um, probably not. I'm skeptical mm -hmm. in, in this direction. I don't think that you will have AI tools uh, that can promise this at least within the, the near future nobody knows what can happen in 30 years but it can help uh, you uh, solving practical problems right like like finding closure finding coefficients finding things that are, can be used for 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 your problem and what i expect as a trend is that you might end up uh, having models that performs much better than the ones that we've been using so far simply because the calibration tools that are used for these models are more powerful. Um, I, I, I think having the expectation that, uh, that, uh, that a tool which is developed for, say, a pipe flow can generalize to uh, flow separation and a wing or things like that, it's, it's very ambitious. And probably this is not going to happen in the near future. But the fact that you might have uh, uh, models that, that you know templates that you know work in a certain kind of, of configuration. Like you want to optimize an heat exchanger and you know that you have flow through 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 many pipes or many bundles. You know what kind this this tool has seen already a lot of them. So maybe I can use that. I will not use the same tool maybe for for flow separation plus an airfoil or things like that. So knowing the bound I will expect that you will have more more tools that are more accurate within a certain range. Yeah limiting the expectation of generalization and maybe if you if we refer to solving turbulence the possibility of having one tool that fits everything then i think this is too ambitious yeah definitely i would probably agree on that point also the question was also a bit aiming towards some people might have seen the documentary of deep mind where this there was they trained a model to play AlphaGo against elise doll like a champion basically and there was a specific move which was like super crazy. Like the pro was thinking, okay, why does it make this move? It's super stupid. But it turned out to be such a good move that he actually learned from that AI model and became a better player himself. So the question now is, if we engineers use models that are so good that we might explore new things that we didn't think of before because we have this complex curve fitting, but still our brain is also acting or like working in a nonlinear way, but maybe not finding problems that are not that easily as compared to a neural network although we have this powerful thing on, on top of our body. Do you think that engineers will be able to also learn more from AI as kind of a body on the side? I think so. Uh, the case of the mind is an amazing case and this documentary is amazing. Highly recommended yeah. the, to, to everyone. Um, I think there are opportunities to learn. Uh, now that, that there we really enter into uh, a, a different field of machine learning, which is reinforcement learning, which is like different than those that I have mentioned yeah. before. Uh, because all the cases which I've mentioned before were more in the supervising realm where somehow you have a supervised. So you, you know the answer and you just try to quote, quote, interpolate, even if mm -hmm. it's not really an interpolation, but you try to, you, you know the answer, let's say, and you cannot expect the model to be better than the supervisor. By definition, it cannot be better than you. Mm -hmm. But then there is this new, uh, I would say, it's, it's not really new, but there's new fever into this direction, thanks to this fantastic documentary and this amazing achievement uh, uh, of AlphaGo, uh, which is about uh, try, uh, to do reinforcement learning. What is the difference? You don't have an, an advisor, you don't know the truth, you try to learn only with the critics. It's a bit uh, 
what uh, we try to do as a supervisor to the PhD. Mm -hmm. So you don't give the answer sometimes because you simply don't have it, uh, but you criticize, right? Without really saying, oh, this is not really good, but I'm not telling you really in which direction, where else to search. Uh, and only in the moment you, you step out as a supervisor, then the student can become better than you, right? Only when in that case where the student has to find his own way or yeah. in the case the agent has to find his own way, then you can get uh, better things. But this is a very difficult topic. We have played a lot with reinforcement learning in fluid flows. Uh, I can, we could have a, maybe a podcast only on that. Yeah. Uh, in general, what you often see is that controlling a flow is not like playing chess or go. So what might end up maybe in 10 years or 15 years, I don't know, I may say something dangerous here, is that uh, the success of reinforcement learning or these algorithms in some fields and their quote, quote, failure in others will simply redefine the scale of what we thought was difficult. So we, we, we thought Go was the most difficult thing ever. There was no way this could be trained and learned. It did. And now we are about to try to find out whether controlling a flow in certain situations is harder or less difficult or, or, or simpler. And it's a difficult question, and there's a lot of activities in this direction. Yeah, I would be interested. How do you approach such a problem, and especially in reinforcement learning? Because I think from a theory perspective, reinforcement learning is one of the hardest things to actually get into. Like I see the you have a book in the back, Deep Reinforcement Learning in Action for Manning. I also have the same book. Amazing book. Yeah, it's a really good book. And yes. um, from the theory, like from all the formulas and actor critic methods and all these kind of things, it's kind of complicated. So how do you take reinforcement learning plus fluid mechanics and kind of find a way to control flow? Especially when it comes to data, how do you give the reinforcement learning model the data even in the first place? You need to know a lot about your flow if you want to try to tackle something like that. Because the way you set up the problem, uh, the way you shape the reward, the reward shaping, uh, really requires a lot of expertise. Mm. So sometimes people think, you know, if you put the reinforcement learning, the agent will learn and I don't have to do much work. I think it's uh, precisely the opposite. Uh, uh, you, you, there's so much knowledge that you have to put into that if you want to have any, any chance. And the way I personally see, but this is really personal view, is that most probably, and that's also the direction that we are taking with our group, is to try to go more and more towards uh, um, model-based, to mm -hmm. some extent, to try to put the model. Because if you look at the way the Model 3 works, um, the Model 3 is trying to, to build a surrogate of, of, of the system. It does it in a very indirect way with the critic, right? The, the learning the value function and so on and so forth. But that in essence is one way of trying to build the surrogate. And it is very difficult to build the surrogate from there. It's extremely difficult. It requires inter interacting with the system many, many times. And what is the most frustrating thing is that you don't even know if there is any chance you can actually get it. And when you have to interact billions of time with the environment to learn something and one environment interaction, uh, the evaluation of one environment interaction takes a nanosecond, it's one thing. But if it takes uh, uh, many computer CP hours, uh, you're, it's not possible you run out, out of business. Even even doing it in a wind tunnel, where you can picture the wind tunnel as a, as a real-time solver of CFD, mm. it's still too slow for the kind of efficiency that you have. So the general tip is don't don't reinvent the wheel. If you know something, help uh, the poor guy trying to learn the things on its own. And then uh, try to, to see to what extent you want this tool to, to complement what you already know. Yeah, that makes sense. Especially now in the, for reinforcement learning and supervised learning, etc. How did you teach yourself these things in machine learning? Because I think there will be 100% a question under the video. How did Miguel teach himself this, this topic of machine learning? How did you get started? Well, I think that one of the, the beauty of this uh, machine learning hype or fever is that there is uh, an explosion, an amount of, of excellent resources uh, on Coursera, mm. uh, things of uh, NG, uh, NG courses. or you, you can find so many resources out there that, uh, that, you can, that you can basically find easily 
almost everything you need, both on the more theoretical part, if you are more like mathematically inclined, yeah. and more on the practical part uh, to learn, uh, I don't know, PyTorch, TensorFlow, or or, or this kind of, of tools or, or, or things. The main way I have been learning it is, as I said also to the students, is project-based, mm -hmm. problem-based. Put a problem uh, in front of you and uh, try to solve it uh, using tools that, that you think uh, can be solved in this way. So yeah, that would be the, the, the main. And that's also the way I teach it. So we usually give many exercises, many problems. We give a bit of theory, we give a bit of codes of exercises, and then we assign a task. And it is through the process of uh, of facing the task that one can actually learn. Yeah, you're doing the exact same thing in the hands-on machine learning course, right? So how much is it for students if people are interested in the pricing? I think 150 euros. Uh, I don't have the table in mind. Maybe we can put it in the in the, in the description. Okay, yeah. It goes. It depends if you're undergrad, or PhD, or, or yeah, exactly. So I don't have the table in mind. Yeah, unfortunately, I'll, we'll post it down in the description. But I think it's definitely worth to give it a try. Either come here to the to VKI or take it online. I think it's also possible, right? Remotely. It is also possible, yes. Excellent. So actually we're approaching the one hour mark. Obviously we have prepared some questions beforehand, but I'll give you a couple of questions which you haven't prepared. So it's going to be a surprise. I asked the same questions to Steve and you ideally answer this, the question in one word or one sentence. So question number one is, what are you most proud of, Miguel? Mm, my students. Then I asked the same thing to Stephen um, Milovan. Are you a turbulent person? No pun intended. Yes. <laughs> okay. You seem to be a laminar person, actually very calm. But, um, who's your biggest inspiration? Um, I have I have many. It's very difficult to say. But I owe a lot to Steve and, and his courses. And uh, Nathan Kutz, I think his book was uh, mm. had a big impact uh, on me. At the, Which book at the beginning. was it? Um, I think, I, think I have the same one. I oh, forgot the title. It should be somewhere. It's, it's from Oxford University Press. It was one of the, it was 2015. Uh, it, ah, well. Matlab, I think Matlab is also explained. It was, it yeah, was I forgot the title. It was, yes, I think it was one of the first books that had uh, theory and then immediately codes, theory and codes. And the way it was, it is framed uh, really shaped a lot to the way now I teach to, to the students. And as you can also see then later in their books, uh, uh, with, with Steve, uh, it's full of codes and things. So you and, and the videos also are uh, this balance between learning something and immediately, immediately see it applied in front of you is something that inspired me a lot, and I owe them a lot in this yeah. in this sense. Bring us to implementation speed, learning something and implementing it very quickly yeah. to see the feedback. And then I, if I may say also, uh, I owe a lot to MIT Open Courseware. I've been watching old courses of Gilbert Strang, for example. Yeah. I'm a Legend. huge, huge fan and. I will sometimes people <laughs> uh, will, will make jokes with me that I would say like, uh, oh, MIT Open Course is the new Netflix or something, whereas I will spend more time on the weekends just just really following that and feeling again a student taking notes in front of a of a giant like Gilbert Strang or things was was really inspiring and you make me really think uh, I really am I own them a lot and I would like to maybe someday pay back someone else with the same uh, inspiration and the same uh, material, let's say. Yeah, I like the antiquism. Maybe a question in between. How much do you spend maybe hours uh, a week on uh, learning yourself? And how much do you actually spend teaching others? That's, uh, that's a beautiful question. I, it varies a lot over the year, but I try to keep always a certain level of learning. Mm. Because if you are, you teach much better if you are learning in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And uh, you 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 know what it means to to learn if you are learning in the same time. So this helps you then to formulate the way you teach, the pace you give, the attention you give to questions, uh, the kind of doubts that people uh, can 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 have. So it is very important to keep always a certain level of learning. It's not always easy. The agendas are getting always very busy. In some period of the year, sometimes I admit it's not possible to be yeah. to have to find the time to do that, but I try to to do that as much as possible. I think it's an interesting point because I feel, from what I see at least, is that most humble professors or people working in academia are the ones who constantly keep learning, and don't pretend that they know everything. I think the most arrogant people I've met in academia or in the industry are those who think they know it all, as mm -hmm. most of the time. And if you keep learning and know that you don't know everything, it keeps you also very grounded. 
and it also puts you in the mindset of a student. Yeah. So it kind of you emp empathize with the with the students that you have, PhD students or master students. So I think that's a cool thing to to uh, as a takeaway from this podcast. Really, really cool. And um, best mentor you ever had. I had uh, I had two very good mentors. Uh, my my professor here, Jean Marie Bouclan, I, I think he really taught me a lot about this simplifying. He was always had this ability to to simplify, and uh, I owe a lot also to Michael Balaban, who is now a retired professor in a, um, from. Uh, he, he's a mathematician. He's been teaching BDEs uh, all his careers. I met him already at the late stage of his career as he was retired. And I think what I got from him was really the criticism. Uh, I've been reading many papers, uh, many things, uh, sometimes without questioning too much certain results, certain things. He's a mathematician. I am an engineer, so our collaboration not always went very smoothly. Uh, but I owe him a lot in, in the ability of, say, of questioning something and, okay, take paper and pen and uh, try to to redrive these things, uh, what limitation does it have? Are you sure that this can work and things like that? So these, I would say, the two person to I, I home the most. Excellent. And um, what would you say is the best tip for you to work on a hard task productively? What do you do? Is it time blocking? Is it a special method that you use? It depends how much I like the task. Uh, okay. If I really like it a lot, I. I sometimes find myself uh, almost in trance. I, I don't even realize uh, that, uh, that that time is passing mm. and I don't, let's say, have to do special things. Otherwise, I would just uh, yeah lock myself in uh, in this office or, or, or at home. And I don't, I don't have those very specific uh, things. I just try to really focus. Sometimes I use the Pomodoro technique, like mm. try to have those breaks and then make sure that during those times you don't check your emails, you don't do the things and so on. But in the moment I find myself trying to resolve to the streak, I understand that I'm not really enjoying that task. When I really am into that, uh, I just, uh, I don't know, my, my eyes become full. Like I am, I'm completely lost and uh, taken by the task. That's cool. What's your favorite operating system? Maybe a redundant question. But what's your answer? Um, I use Windows most of the time. And I'm sorry for that. I would have expected a different answer. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. uh, I do have Linux. I've been using Linux a lot. But now here at VGA, we're using a lot of Windows. And I'm getting used to that. There are some cool features on Microsoft, or, uh, say Outlook or whatever, which mm. I, I tend to use. Uh, so yeah, I would say I'm more a Windows user. But uh, it's not because I really love it or whatever. It's just because I, I, have, it, I have this and I'm OK with it's this. More convenient. Got it. If you could spend one day with a celebrity, who would it be? A celebrity? It could be could be dead or alive. Or alive. Gilbert Strike. I okay. consider him a celebrity. Yeah, he's pretty cool. I had him on the podcast. Really humble yeah, guy. So. Really, really cool. Um, favorite app on your phone? Mm, Spotify. Nice. Um, a video that you recorded for your own channel or in general that you enjoyed filming the most? All the videos of uh, Modulo, I would say. So Modulo is another open source code which we developed for mm -hmm. multi-scale uh, model analysis and uh, things like this. And uh, it was my first experience recording things. And I, I kind of, uh, when I watch again those videos, I really hear myself uh, trying and then uh, learning how to break the video into short because maybe you've done a mistake and you lose three minutes of recording or things like that. So mm. I think uh, I will take, we'll pick those ones, mm. modular videos. Excellent skill, I think. And uh, we talked about this as well. I think you are a natural in front of the camera, guys. Let us know in the comments. And then uh, we'll work on this hands-on machine learning thing, as I said. But yeah. Great pleasure. Um, favorite programming language? Python. Nice. Favorite movie? Hmm. The others. Okay. Um, who will win the AI race? Country or you can name a country. If there's a thing called AI race, who's going to make it? I don't like to see it as a race and as a country, but uh, well, in, there's a lot of development in the US and in China as well. So it's very difficult to say. And depends on how we define the race, but at the moment, I would say but China and the US are really fighting for that, I would say. Mm. What are your concerns regarding AI in terms of be it being misused? People not understanding enough about it. 
uh, I think this is uh, something that we have to be careful about because in the moment you don't understand and because of the way the the, the way uh, it is the, the achievement of AI are often phrased uh, they are very prone to to science fiction uh, uh, science fictionism let's say the, mm. it is very easy to 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 play with our fears and when you scare someone that's not good uh, the only solution is to know enough about what is happening under the hood. Mm. I think people also kind of develop sometimes, not obviously not everyone, kind of this um, victim, victim mentality because they think AI is this super mighty thing that will replace all jobs. And people are going to be like, okay, I'm just a bookkeeper or whatever, and I'm just not going to upskill myself and learn more about AI maybe to work next to AI as kind of an enhancement tool. So they just give up and don't learn anything about it. So I think a general recommendation would be to just get into it, maybe learn the basics of AI and also see what it can do and what, what it cannot do. I think that's also super important. But yeah, um, assuming AGI, an AGI system would be possible within the next five to 10 years, what's the first question you asked an AGI system? How did you get there? I mean, how, how do you work? Mm -hmm. That's a good one. What is one superpower you would like to have? Um, being able to read faster. Yeah, I think that's a good one. I would love to have that as well. Sometimes you read a sentence and you read it again and you read it again. Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. And last question, if you were a superhero, what would your name be? Huh. Um, I think Miguel is fine. And Miguel sounds good. As a, that's fine. Yeah. yeah, I think that's good. Cool. Any closing remarks or motivating words to the audience, Miguel? Then we'll wrap it up. Um, I would say don't be an extremist, be open-minded, try to learn in the most uh, uh, impartial way as possible uh, and be critical uh, so that you that you can really use tools. You cannot use tools if you're not sufficiently critical about what they can do. Perfect. With that, thank you very much, Miguel. It was roughly an hour now for the podcast. Thank you very much for inviting me into this beautiful place. And I'll have a talk in two and a half hours roughly to the audience. Yes. Is it two and a half? No, one and a half hour, I think. It's a two. The talk it's a is two, a two. Right. So we will have maybe some time for a tour or something. Definitely. Yeah. You show me around. But yeah, can definitely recommend get in touch with Miguel. I'll put every link down in the description. And then, uh, yeah, looking forward to seeing you for a second time. Thank you for, for coming to visiting us and for all the coaching about uh, the, 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 the online and the novelties and the life of an influencer, let's say. Uh, it's a great pleasure, great honor. And I really thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much, Miguel. Thank you.